Hey everyone, welcome to the 7investing.com podcast. Our mission here at 7investing is to empower you to invest in your future. We do that by providing a ton of free educational content like this podcast and by offering a monthly subscription service where our team of advisors provides our seven best ideas in the stock market each month for just $17. I'm excited today uh, for our guest. Um, we've got Jason Evans here, who is the co-founder and chief business officer at Oxio. Um, so you're doing that today. From 2014 to 2018, you were the director of product and also managing director at Fastly's New York office. And I think you you did a few other things there as well, because that's what happens uh, at, at startups like that or at early stage businesses. Uh, prior to that, Jason co-founded Stack Pop, which is an infrastructure focused startup in 2011. And then before that, you, you spent 13 years building, scaling, and managing infrastructure teams at companies like MediaMath, Panther, Panther Express, CDN, and GLG. So Jason, thanks for being here. I'm excited to get to know you a little bit and, and just learn from your experience. Um, first thing I'd like to ask you is if there's anything I left out in the intro, and then if you could just tell us a little bit more about Oxio and what you're working on there. Sure, no, I, I think you covered it quite well, actually. Um, yeah, so Oxio is, um, we're about a two and a half year old company uh, headquartered in New York, uh, launched in Mexico. We have a big Latin American focus. Uh, we, we have a mobile platform that essentially allows anyone, any brand, enterprise developer to spin up their own private LTE instance. Um, in provided they have a SIM in, in minutes, um, with the idea being that um, these these companies can can benefit from owning the entire stack. Uh, they you know they get insight to to the users uh, into the data. They can help them make better business decisions. Um, they can control the quality of service. They can control uh, what sort of uh, service and offerings they they give to their their customers, their existing customers. Um, and yeah, so, so we, we have a big focus in getting, you know, one of the, as we were talking earlier, um, data, mobile data, so megabytes and gigabytes in, in Mexico and in Latin America uh, are extremely expensive compared to what the average salary is for, for, uh, for, uh, for people in, in Mexico. And so, you know, one of the problems is you have <clears throat> all these efforts and initiatives uh, from financial products, from, from trying to get people banked, from trying to get them credit. Um, and, and there's, you know, there's companies in Mexico, there's Ta uh, Tala, Klar, um, just tons of fintechs that are, that are doing different types of, of loans and, uh, and debit cards and things like that. Um, but it doesn't work if people aren't connected. And so what you have is this uh, incongruity of people who want to be online, people who scavenge Wi-Fi, um, people who, who want to be a part of the, the digital economy and the mobile economy, but they can't because they can't afford it. So, so one of our goals is to make data cheaper, make it more accessible. Um, and, and one of the ways to do this is to, to let brands and, and enterprises who, who already have a business, they already have a customer base, they already have a goal, um, to let them come in and essentially subsidize or you know, sponsor that service, subsidize that service. Um, and not like we see today with like, you sign on to a Wi-Fi and they make you watch a video, like actually providing the entire mobile experience. And, and so we package that up for them, uh, make it super turnkey. There, there's a few options here and there, but um, they control their policies, they control the prices, they control the speeds. Um, and, and so it really allows um, companies that can benefit from integrating their product experience with mobility. Um, it, it lets them, letting them own that and provide that for, for their customers and their future customers. Um, we found has been, has resonated super well with the, um, the Latin America market. Yeah, it, and that's really interesting. And it's something that's easy as a, a person living in the United States where um, high speed internet and mobile data access is, is as you mentioned, a, a much lower portion of what the average income is than in other parts of the world. It's really easy to forget that as much as we see these awesome things and, and mobile payments companies opening up these opportunities for businesses in other parts of the world, there's key pieces there like connectivity to the internet and even cell phone plans that, that are just not as common in, in other places. And so, exactly. um, I know you have two products listed on the site. The first is kind of the enterprise cloud. And the second is just the analytics suite. Um, what I would love to know is 
what was the reason for going with those two products uh, as kind of your first products as, as a company? Yeah, so, so I will caveat and say our website is, uh, like I was telling you, it's, we're about two weeks out from the, the relaunch. It's not okay. super, um, <laughs> it's not really easy to, to, to tell what we're doing from, from the current site. Um, we've sort of since collapsed our, the analytics suite is now just part of the brand, you know, platform. Got it. Um, and so, and yeah, and I think like there's different philosophies on like what, you know, do you have different products? Do you have features? Uh, do you have use cases? And I, we had had this at, at Fastlake too, right? It's for a long time. It's like, what's your product? And it's like, oh, well, our product are, ed, you know, it's edge dictionaries, it's logging. Uh, but there were people who said, no, your product is CDN. Those are features on, on, on top of the CDN or the edge cloud. Um, and so I, I, I actually think that, um, I feel like that encompasses more of how we think about it. So our product is, is the brand VNO platform. Um, the, the data and the analytics suite that that's mostly meant. So, you know, going back to the brand, um, example. So, so to give you a, a more concrete example, let's say that we're working with, you know, Mexico, they have the, uh, the TN does the corner stores are very big, for example, right? So there's OXO, 7-Eleven, Circle K. Um, and so these corner stores are a big part of people's daily lives. And since the economy is, you know, 85%, 90% cash in Mexico, um, very, very heavy cash economy, which is also presents its own, pro it's opportunity, you know, presents the, the opportunities and the problems, but, um, people go into these corner stores to, to pay top ups, right? So they'll go in, they'll give them their phone number. Uh, they'll type in the phone number. They'll say, how much do you want to put on? People don't really understand the plans and what they're getting for it. But, you know, it could be Telcel, AT&T, Movistar Telefonica. Uh, it could be an MVNO. Um, and they, you know, they give them cash. They get data and, and service on their plan. Um, so we've, these corner stores get paid a small commission for doing that. Um, we've actually found uh, a good traction with those guys for offering their own product, right? So imagine, you know, a 7-Eleven or a Circle K offering where, um, or any corner store where it's their mobile product, right? So they're making more margins, but also they now, you know, if you think about the way that our, the way that we design our technology, the SIM chip sort of becomes like this, this programmable device in, inside the phone, right? So it's got these very, you know, it's got carrier level, carrier level privileges. Um, it speaks to an app that's, that's on the phone and it also speaks to our, our services in the cloud. Um, and so now a corner store can go and do a partnership with Heineken or Corona or Pepsi or, or whoever it might be. Um, or, you know, it could be a gaming company. It, it doesn't matter. Right. But now when you have this, this corner store mobile product, um, you know, as you interact with the corner store, as you interact with brands, um, you start to create this, this mobile, mobile identity that's privacy friendly, but this mobile identity where, um, you know, Heineken thinks you're interesting, right? Or Pepsi thinks you're interesting. And, and they say, hey, you know what? I'm going to pay for your unlimited mobile plan this month if you'll answer, um, you know, if you'll take a survey every, you know, two gigabytes of data used, right? Or if you'll watch this video um, or, you know, let us know which, what your favorite product is or take a picture and post it on social media. So you can start to essentially um, encourage behavior, uh, user and, and, and customer behavior. Uh, the brands can, can, they can control that directly. And they get that one-to-one -one relationship with the consumer, which brands don't often have, right? Like yeah. you don't, you don't buy your Pepsi directly from Pepsi, right? You buy your Pepsi from, from Walmart or you buy your Pepsi from, from the gas station, right? And so it's very valuable to the brands to get this sort of consistent connection. So if they're sponsoring you for a month, they're, you know, they're your provider essentially for the month, right? We change the phone name. It's, it's sort of, you know, it, it's all virtual. So, you know, you're now on Pepsi mobile. Uh, by the way, none of these are clients. I'm just using the example. Right, right, um, right. And uh, you, you, you use Pepsi Mobile, and now Pepsi gets the, you know, they pay a lot of money for, for user research and, and user surveys, right? So it's almost got a little Nielsen-ish uh, aspect to it as well, right? Is is maybe a good correlation in the U.S. For these brands, uh, they don't necessarily know what to do with the data, so we sort of expose a base level analytics suite to them. Um, so that they can start to make sense of it. We can hook into uh, their CRM. We can hook into Google Analytics. We can, we can hook into different things for them. So, so we present that just so that they have the ability to, uh, and, you know, the larger companies probably have a pretty good system in place, but some of the companies that we work with don't. Yep. Um, and so just giving them some way to make sense of the data is, you know, it's like the, 
um, the full log full logging feature, right? Like as far as I know, Fastly was the only one that uh, I don't know who has it now, but at the time we were the only ones that that had it in real time. But a lot of customers didn't know what to do with it, right? Like you can point a fire hose of full logs, but like you know it's super expensive to store it on a cloud log provider. Um, and if you don't really have a strategy for what to do with that, you know, it's, it's, it's cool to have that data, but it's, it's not as valuable. So, so that was the analytics part of that. Yeah. Cool. But I'm excited to kind of just watch from afar and I'll keep track of obviously your social media and your site and, and watch how it progresses. Cause it's a really interesting layer. It feels like that, like you said, it benefits partners and companies, but also benefits users as well with affordable access to the internet, which is, as we've seen here, can do amazing things and improve quality of life and stuff like that. And probably even more so in, in other countries um, around the world as well, who are, who maybe still don't have access to, to internet the way that we're used to here in the United States. You mentioned a couple of things there where the experience you had at Fastly um, have, has led to the mindset that you have, but it, it, it feels like even with what you're doing today, it's still very user or developer focus. Like you, you know, you talked about um, just people being able to spin up their own LTE networks and stuff like that. Very similar to what people can do um, by going to Fastly's website or even Twilio's website or whatever, where developers are empowered to um, kind of build their own apps and, and do their own things without having to go through this long sales process. Um, so I would love to, start talking about your your time at Fastly. You were there from 2014 to 2018, and I did a little spy research on you. I found your LinkedIn, and you have this, um, this description about your time at Fastly. So it says, I joined Fastly in 2014 because you believed in the team, in the vision of the edge cloud, and that CDNs were not a solved problem. Over your four years, you wore several different hats at one of the fastest growing B2B businesses in the world, overseeing the New York efforts and helping close strategic deals, leading to a global product team in the UK, San Francisco, and New York City. Um, kicking off new initiatives in the server to server header bidding space and running a sales vertical focused on ad tech and MarTech. Um, so I'm a huge fan of Fastly. It's, it's been one of my biggest personal holdings. Uh, you know, I like what the business does and, and I really like what appears to be the culture there. If you look at Glassdoor and the CEO ratings. Um, so I'd love to just hear about your experience there. Um, I had known Archer for a few years. We were on this, um, I met him on this tech council uh, that, do you remember Dying DNS? They sold the Oracle. Um, they were kind of, uh, you know, the authoritative DNS for a bunch of big companies. They had the big outage a few years ago, which, which most people know them from. Uh, but no, it was Dime was a great company. Anyway, they had this tech council for their customers. And so I met Archer on that. And so, you know, I was sort of fascinated by Fastly from, I guess this was like 2000. I was still in media math. So it was like 2011, 2012, like super, super early. Um, and so, you know, we would, we would chat and, and, um, I would, and then he ended up hiring the CTO of Dime, Tom Daly. Um, who, who was also, he was an advisor, uh, he was an advisor for Stack Pop. He was a good friend of mine. And, um, so, and I just, I like both those guys I and mean, they were smart and just like talking to Archer. I mean, I don't know if you've ever, you probably watched his talks. Um, you know, he's just like, he's just sort of next level, um, intelligent when it, when, especially when it comes to, to understanding like what happens in a, in a, in a computer, right? Like what, and, and that was one of the reasons that, that those guys were so good in the beginning is like they just thought about performance from uh, on a whole nother level, right? Like, um, <clears throat> you know, like I think about like the first CDN I worked at was, was called Panther. Funny enough, um, Archer was a customer of Panther when he was at Wikia. Um, and he was one, you know, when you have, when you're an infrastructure provider, you have these customers who, you know, like as soon as you have a blip or as soon as you have any sort of production uh, outage or, or not even outage, but you know, issue, that they're going to be right on top of it, right? They're monitoring, they're paying attention. And so Archer was, was one of those customers and he was always frustrated by the fact that it took minutes to, to purge content. Keep in mind at the time it took Akamai hours, um, like if not a day to purge content entirely from the network. Um, so this concept of, of instant cache and validation was as far as anyone was concerned in that business impossible. Um, so like, I, I remember a ticket from a long time ago, Arch and I laughed about, I guess, later on, but um, 
he was like, why does it take five minutes to, to purge my cash? And we're like, five minutes is really good. Like it's, it's so much better than what's, what's out there. Um, but you know, that was essentially one of the drivers of why he built with Kia. Uh, sorry, he left, he built Fastly, you know, sort of, he, he spawned that project uh, while he was CPO of Wikia. Um, and so just, just the fact that, that you know, Tyler and, and Simon and Jason and, and Archer and those guys did that um, was just fascinating. And so like from a technology standpoint, like I feel like Fastly always started like so, you know, just on a completely different level than anyone else. And, um, and so, and, you know, I, I liked, uh, Archer's personality, obviously Tom being there was great and he was, uh, sort of a brilliant infrastructure and, and networking mind. Um, and so I kind of always, I had my own company at the time. Um, and so it just wasn't time, but, um, yeah, I, I had always sort of wanted to join if, if something happened. And then the, the opportunity came up after we, um, started transitioning out of stack pop. And um, I just kind of reached out and said, hey, I want to join the company. I don't really care what I do. Nice. Um, they asked me if I wanted to live in San Francisco or New York. And I said, New York's, I guess, better for now. And so that's so I became managing director of New York, which was sort of a hybrid sales um, te tech overlay, you know, office uh, or, you know, sort of region management sort of thing. Um, but, yeah, so I, I spent most of my time, though, that first year on the, on the commercial side and the customer side. So, you know, literally just going door to door in New York, like we media was a really good, um, just interrupt me by the way, Austin, if this, if you want to take it a certain yeah, way. No, no. Um, media, media was great for us because, um, if you think about media, right? Like when you pull if you're Vox or Buzzfeed or, or, uh, you know, business insider or whatever, um, if you can only cash, the, um, if you can only catch the images, like it just kind of sucks, right? Like you're always blocking yourself at, at the root domain. If you can't cash CNN.com or if you can't cash BuzzFeed.com, then, you know, it's just, you're just going to have an experience where like, okay, yeah, your images are at the edge, but like all this, you know, all this HTML, um, in the root, the, the root asset is, is going to take forever to load. So because of the, the instant cache validation, right? So the, the sort of base number is 150 milliseconds. Um, your your content is perched globally, right? And so and so no one else could do that. And so what Fastly did was they had the the instant um, invalidation, and then they also built with the developer mindset where you could use APIs like the the purge API was just an HTTP endpoint. So you just go into your CRM and you publish a story. And and again, the danger was okay if you did cache your HTML on on Akamai at the time. I'm I'm not going to pick on Akamai, but this is a common use case. Um, you, you, you could, it was too dangerous because if you made a mistake or if you had to issue a correction, um, it would literally take hours around the globe to, um, to, uh, for that to invalidate. Right. But with Fastly, since it was instant, you could put out whatever you wanted, text, whatever. And if you needed to make a correction in your, what we would tell people is in their CRM, whatever their uh, not CRM, their, um, uh, their content management. So, um, CM, CMS, um, <clears throat> in your CMS, just call the, call the purge API whenever you make a change and, you know, we'll like, fastly would, would purge the cache and it would be instantaneously populated. So, so media was like a field day for us. So once we got a couple of good customers, um, <clears throat> I think like I think business insider was definitely one of, one of our first. And it was, you know, at the time of a really amazing deal. And, and so, you know, we would just piggyback off, off each of those. And, and so, and that was a what good were, New York. What were those? What were those early conversations like um, as a as kind of like a scrappy company with maybe without a proven product yet um, with some of those customers and what did it take to convince them? Um, did they have to see it? Did was it just were you just like give us a shot and and try us and then you kind of proved how much faster it was? So yeah, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> so you you mentioned this earlier in about the philosophy at Oxio and Twilio and, and Fastly and, and companies like that. Like I'm a huge believer in like, you need to have a, if you're going to be an enterprise software business, you need to have a product that developers love and yeah. will, will use no matter what. And then they'll evangelize that up, right. They'll, they'll push that up through the organization. Um, you also need to have an enterprise sales team or a sales team. That's also working that from, from the, the top down, right. 
um, in that. Um, and, and to me, that that formula is is the only formula in 2020 of how to build a software business. Um, and so Fassi had done that, right? Like Archer and, and those guys had been super involved with um, with uh, like the the tech conferences, um, like the the O'Reilly conferences, and, and all this sort of infrastructure stuff for a long time. So they had a good core base, right? Like I mean, like you know, all the you know Simon was really good friends with the early Slack guys, right? So Slack was an early customer, and and so we had enough validation from uh, from from customers that were respected from a technology standpoint that, and, and then we had the product which developers could use and like, you know, you can't, you know, at the, at the time, at least I don't know now, but um, there's no way that you were going to get an Akamai API account without spending hours on the phone and, you know, hearing sales pitches and things like that. And so, yeah, um, uh, Joshua Bixby has been, t he talks about that still on, even on some of the earnings conference calls and different events is um, the, where COVID has actually caused like the steak dinner sales to go away. And, and now yeah. it's truly becoming like the best of the best win because you might meet over a zoom and you don't have to kind of wine and dine these different customers. So they're still talking about that today. Yeah, no, it's, it's totally true. I mean, honestly, like back to your earlier question, like with COVID, like we were, Oxio was, was much more efficient in terms yeah. of like, you know, cause when you go down to Mexico city, like Mexico city is a, it's a great city. It's hell on traffic. Um, so if you have a meeting in Santa Fe to, to Polanco, like, you know, good luck getting there in less than an hour and a half. And, and then, you know, the culture in Mexico is like three hour lunches with lots of tequila and things like that. So, um, <laughs> I spent, I spent so, some yes. time in, in Jordan and it was the same, the same way, very long meetings and food and stuff like that. It's fun, but it's, yeah, it's not the most efficient. Yeah. It's not the most efficient. So, so yeah, to answer your question, we we had we had good validation from some some early power customers like um, Twitter it was um, for a long time our biggest customer, um, and and I know they had been working on that account for a long time. Like Slack was there, uh, Etsy, and again like the Etsy guys were kind of like um, it's, speaking of Signal Science, like the, the Etsy guys I think came out of uh, the Signal Science guys came out of Etsy early on. Um, we had a product that developers liked that we're interested in. So we would go in through them most of the time. And um, yeah, just as we, it, it wasn't easy. Like it, you know, it, 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 it's, it was pretty challenging at the time. I mean, we didn't have the network capacity that NAC might have. We didn't, we didn't have a security product at the time. Um, there was, uh, you know, Acme was still very, very present in, in almost every deal. Um, uh, Acme, they, they started playing ball earlier than I thought on the price side of things. Um, they, you know, they had a, they, they could sort of name their price for a long time, especially with media companies who weren't, you know, video is a little different because there's so much bandwidth, but the media companies, like people were overpaying and, and um, but it wasn't easy, but we, we had the, um, we, we made the developers that the early team built a product that developers love to use. And so, yeah, you go in and you're like, okay, put, you know, put this up on your, put this up on the website. Okay. Hit purge, refresh, boom, it's gone. So, you know, it was an easy demo to, to show them that on the media side. Yeah. And I think that's still, um, and again, Joshua Bixby has, has talked about this a little bit as, as especially now we're seeing Shopify as a customer and how fast they've grown. And even um, he didn't say this directly about TikTok, but my, one of my takeaways about TikTok you know, I think this is seen as a risk to Fastly because um, I think it's 12% uh, of Fastly's revenue for the last six months came from TikTok. Half of that was from the U.S. revenue. So, you know, after the last earnings, there was this big fear of losing the TikTok revenue. But I'm looking at it and I'm like, this is the best advertising in the world because this is the the one of the fastest growing app, probably the fastest growing app in the world other than Zoom. And uh, it's fast, they use Fastly. So, you know, whether TikTok stays or goes, what, why wouldn't the next app that wants to grow exponentially, you know, use Fastly after they know that TikTok was able to, to do the same thing? And I'm sure there's more, it's more complicated than that, but that was kind of my, my high level takeaway. So it still seems like Fastly is uh, proving to everybody that, that, you know, performance is, is top notch. Um, yeah. and so it, yeah, and, it's interesting. 
Yeah, and another thing that we would, um, speaking of which, like if I put on my like sales hat from from a long time ago, um, we would we would constantly, and I guess uh, maybe I don't know if you looked at the the blog stuff, but like we would talk. I think I wrote a couple things about performance. We would talk about that a lot, um, and um, we would we we really tried to create the story that performance is not just how a stat how the, the milliseconds it takes for a static object to respond to a third party. Uh, monitoring service, right? That's that's how you know people used to use. Uh, I mean, they still do. Like uh, companies like Catchpoint is a great company. Um, Gomez was one back in the day. But you know, basically, what you would do is you would say, okay, I have three CDNs. I'm going to monitor this object from each from multiple different cities and multiple different carriers, so I can understand what the uh, response time is from from different regions and, and over different carriers. And um, <clears throat> you know. Clearly, that was easily gameable, right? So if it's just a static object sitting in RAM, um, it, it's not that interesting. But you know, so when we would talk about performance, we would say performance is also like how how long it takes you to to invalidate your cache and purge your cache. How long does it take you to push out a config change, right? That was another that was another place where we had a huge advantage over Akamai. Um, you know, every user had full control of the, their VCL configuration, which already on its own was super powerful and and, and super granular. Um, and so you could push, you know, you could literally push out your configuration. It wasn't milliseconds, but it was seconds, right? So you screw up um, your, your configuration and, and things start failing, you could roll back to the latest version, like it literally in um, literally in seconds. And so, you know, that's, that's performance, right? Like performance is also being able to see what's going on at the edge, right? And we were the only company, the, the only CDN, Edge Cloud. We didn't call ourselves Edge Cloud back then, by the way. Um, what we were the only CDN that could give you literal real time logging. And so, you know, instead of being, and we use this, I use the story docs too, but uh, instead of your CDN being a black box, right? This sort of black box of like, all right, C name your, your domain over the CDN and then all the magic happens. Um, we could, Fastly could give you true visibility on what was going on at the edge of your network with the logs. And so we kind of, you know, we started to create that story of performance is all of these things, um, not just a, a third party response time that, that's easily gameable. We've talked a lot about the approach or the understanding of Fastly from a kind of a B2B perspective or what Fastly's direct customers might might experience. But for people uh, that are maybe just everyday Shopify users or Spotify users or any different customer of Fastly, how does Fastly in, in a CDN, how does that impact their experience as a user? Traditionally, like it, it was, really just for static objects, right? If you look at sort of the origins of, of Akamai and the um, and Spidera and some of those companies in, in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, essentially what a CDN does is it moves the content closer to the end user and it, it makes the entire experience better, right? Because, I mean, it, no matter what you do on the internet, right, you always have this, the speed of light problem, meaning that <clears throat> if, um, you know, if you're, uh, 10, you know, 5,000 miles away from a piece of content, like you look at the speed of light over a fiber plus a little network overhead plus some fiber overhead and, and inconsistencies and retransmits on, on things like that. And, you know, it just, it's, it's a poor experience if you have to, you know, if you have uh, hundreds of milliseconds latency every time you need to do something, right? Um, and so the traditional role of a CDN was just to, to get content closer to the end user. For the reasons we talked about earlier, it was typically only static content, right? You couldn't purge HTML, you couldn't purge text uh, quick enough, you couldn't purge HTML quick enough. Uh, JavaScript was was tricky if you needed to update the, the JavaScript. Um, so yeah, so when you think about a, a Spotify and a, and, a, um, and a Shopify and, and some of the sort of power customers that, that Fastly has, and, and they had those guys for, a, a, like, I'm still blown away. I mean, congratulations to the Shopify guys. I'm, I'm still blown away at how fast that, company grew and how it grew. Um, <laughs> but you, I think one of the things that, that describe those guys is, uh, it, I, I don't, I don't know, like I, I, uh, I know some of the Shopify guys, but uh, sorry, uh, Spotify guys, but um, what Fastly did, like, again, like with, with extending code, with extending code to the edge, right. But in the form of VCL, the, the configured varnish configuration language, um, what they did with making everything instantaneous is, you now like it felt like your own infrastructure right and, and so there was this sort of visceral feeling that you controlled you you now like as a as a fastly customer 
you literally have access to a, you know, it wasn't this at the time, but today, like a terabit per second network, right? Or, or sorry, a uh, uh, hundred, what are they, a hundred terabits per second? I don't know. Um, uh, they had it on I, the don't, side. I don't have it, I don't have it pulled I, up, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so, so um, I think that, you know, when you, when you have access to like this huge powerful network, it can protect you from DDoS attacks, you can do everything fast. And, and, you know, when it's super responsive and super configurable, it, uh, it it's a huge advantage. And so I think for guys like, you know, if you think about Shopify, like clearly, like in order for them to be able to cache things and they have so much dynamic content and content that's in, you know, that's not consistent from one user to the next and prices change and things like that. Like it's a great use case for, for Fessly because it can instantaneously get rid of anything that you don't like, right? It can serve up a different object based on the request itself. Like where's the user coming from? What is, what's in their cookie? Uh, what's their language preference? Things like that. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think that that's what, <clears throat> like when you, when you spin up um, Spotify, I, I don't know exactly how they, how they're using Fastly today. Um, but, and, but like, you just you just don't have access to and again I haven't followed this as closely in the past two years so I don't know exactly what the the other edge cloud companies are doing but you know you just didn't have those those options with, with the other guys and so it was more of a it was sort of a legacy like and I know people like insult older CDNs by using that word but you know there is like there is a new way of publishing content on on the web and some companies are there and some companies are not but but I think you know giving developers the power to, to, to make that feel like their infrastructure was, was something that, that really worked. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, you know, my takeaway is that it, it feels like as a user out here, all these customized playlists that I get from Spotify, or if I'm shopping on Shopify, prices that are updated and accurate, inventory that's updated and accurate, and, and basically customized down to where I'm at, my preferences and things like that. That's how I'm able to get those types of what feel like unique experiences from all these different services that I use or from basically CDN and, and edge cloud. Like that's the uh, improved user experience. I think that comes and then fastly, I believe um, is, is one of the best at, at providing that. So I just wanted to hear from your perspective um, from somebody that's actually been there and, and done it versus me just kind of reading about it. Um, so and the, the cool thing about CDNs too, I'll, I'll spend like you can, you know, if, if, if you open up your dev tools or if you, you know, open up a, a Wireshark or, or sniff your traffic, you can actually just see a lot, right? So like, you know, I remember like the person that exposed that uh, Amazon was a customer and stuff like that. Like it's all just kind of public information. So if you're ever I curious and, and you have some, Dan, he, he's, he's a super good guy. He's, he's been a uh, good fast. But, um, you know, if you're ever curious of what's going on, you can put, you could take your, your Spotify app, um, and put it through like a, a local proxy on your laptop and then just sort of, uh, I mean, TLS makes it a little harder if, if it's encrypting everything, but you can kind of get an idea for, for what's going on under the hood and like how, um, how that particular customer application is, is using its, its CDN partner. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, that was really interesting to see that Amazon was using, was using Fastly, but Fastly has not talked about Amazon as being a customer yet. So it's obviously not at, at that point where, where Amazon right. is, has given the approval for that. Um, if right. it's official or not, which neither of us here are saying that, that Fastly has said that. Um, All right. So why wouldn't an Amazon or a cloud provider just, just be able to crush uh, Fastly or, or any CDN? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it's, I mean, we got this question a lot early on, and like, I think, I don't know, I think a lot of a lot of investors ask this question. I think it's a little lazy. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's just hard for somebody to to be good at everything, right? Like AWS is an amazing platform and product. It also does everything, right? And so, yeah. <laughs> you know, so like, there's a lot of like, there's definitely some, um, you know, like. S3, in my opinion, is a much better product than, than ELB or, or uh, ALB, right? Load balancing stuff. Um, so, you know, I think part of its focus, I, I do think that um, the you you just you don't get the um, the brain and the technical the technical advantage that um, that some of those guys, that Archer and, and a lot of those guys, gave uh, fastly in, in the beginning, and that continued on, right? When you start out. 10 steps ahead of anybody before, before they move, like it's, it's easier to stay a little bit ahead. So, you know, I think part of it was focus. Um, 
and you know, and when you don't have a a you know thousand purpose network, right? Um, it is easier to do one, two, three things well, right? Yeah. Um, and so that just sort of obsessiveness on performance, um, and that, that's one of the things where like with, from a, just a Cloudflare business model. And, and by the way, I, I I do have my beefs w- with them, but you know I I think Cloudflare does do some things well, right? They they do release um, they release a lot of products. They're they're really good at releasing new products. Um, they, you know, as far as, as I'm concerned, like they're the closest thing to Fastly in terms of um, edge logic and putting, you know, pushing out, uh, pushing out code that, that can be run on the edge servers. Um, <clears throat> but it's also like, you know, when you have tens of thousands, I, I don't know how many customers they have, but hundreds of thousands of, of customers or something, um, you know, like there, there is like, there's physics there, right? And so, you know, it, if if you have hundreds of thousands of customers, that's you know that's that's heavy from a configuration standpoint. It it hurts your cash the cash ability, right? One of the things that um, there's a guy amazing dude at Fastly called uh, Huma Vashti, uh who who does performance stuff for them. Um, it's really a real HTTP wizard. Um, <clears throat> you know, we would monitor how long an object, a non-hot object, would stay in a cache, right? And and that's a very important thing. And Huma has some talks on that actually. That are, that are public, but um, when you look at, um, you know, when something, when an when object's falling out of cache in five minutes, like, that's, that's a real problem, right? Like, so when it got below six hours, I would get worried. And, and so um, I think that, um, I think that there are, there are trade-offs in, in approaches on that. Um, and I forget, sorry, we're, <laughs> What was the question that I, I kind of just why wouldn't, rolled into? You, you answered it. I, like, why wouldn't these big uh, cloud providers just come in and uh. crush the CDNs and fast? And, and I, um, you said what I believe is that, you know, when somebody's maniacally focused on being really good at this one thing versus an Amazon, even though they've got all the resources in the world, it really doesn't impact Amazon's business that much. But if Fastly yeah. doesn't do a good job at it, then Fastly goes out of business, you know? And there's probably benefits yeah. to, uh, and for some things, not just completely relying on a single cloud vendor for everything. So, you know, there's probably advantages to companies in, in that way as well. Um, yeah, I, I know we're at when we're in our last minute here, but um, you know, as far as expanding use cases for edge computing, wh- where do you see that going in, in the next few years or, or five years? There's been talk of autonomous vehicles and things like that. Yeah, the autonomous vehicles are always kind of the the, the use case people use. I, yeah, yeah. You know, I think that there's um, there's a really good talk. I'm I'm pretty sure it's on on YouTube. Ty, uh, Tyler McMullen is the CTO of Fastly, uh, another another brilliant dude. Um, and he um, he gave a talk on sort of the future of edge computing, and you know, he brought up the obvious, which is like like edge computing is here, like it's going to get better. There, there's, there's, you know, the IOT use cases, the, the, the car use cases, um, but you still have to deal with the data, right? And so, you know, it's, you can, you can do logic at the edge, but if that logic requires uh, querying a large data set or having a large data set to, to choose from at the edge, then, you know, you're, you're going to be super limited in that. And, and I think that's, to me, that's one of the big unsolved problems. And one of the things that, that's holding back the use cases is, you know, think about how much data we're generating now, how much is collected, um, how much like the average enterprise or, or startup uh, stores in, in gigabytes, terabytes a day. Um, and so the, the data storage issue is, is still one that I feel like hasn't, it hasn't been solved to a point where, you know, it, it's, it's holding back the, the sort of explosion of edge compute. Um, so, you know, I, I think simple, simple decisions can be, can be made at the edge, right? Like if you know the, the response, to, if you just need to let someone know, okay, I heard you, um, by the way, I'm going to take this data that you sent me and I'm going to asynchronously load this into a, a data warehouse for you. Um, you know, they, there's a lot of use cases like that. Um, I do think with um, this kind of the stuff that, that Oxio is doing on the private LTE side, um, you know, as metal and hardware gets cheaper and cheaper, as, as it always does, um, you know, you can start to put enough out there, right? You, you can start to sort of figure out which data sets should be loaded into um, into which regions and, and which data centers and things like that. Um, but 
yeah, so so I don't I don't have a magic answer of what's the next big thing for edge computing, um, but I I do think that we're still a ways off from seeing a huge huge like groundbreaking change on it, um, and but yeah I, I think um, I think mobile uh, mobile will obviously drive it and, and as the as the mobile ecosystem changes then you know who who's operating that network at the edge and and who's operating it at the core. Uh, I think that's going to that's going to shift, and there's a lot of opportunity there for for companies to 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 be in that path, so that it's not just this big black box network, big black box CDN, and then your your AWS instances. So, awesome. Well, Jason, I know you got to go. Um, thanks for your time, uh, everyone that's listening. You can follow Jason at Jason H Evans on Twitter. Uh, we're here to empower you to invest in your future. Thanks for listening. <laughs>